going to be talking with you tonight about a focus for the last days. It's going to take me a while to really get into the meat of what I want to say, but I want to first establish the reality that these are the last days. We're going to talk about some of the things that happened in the last days, and then we're going to specifically look at what Jesus tells us to be doing in the last days. Um, right, right now, we're in a situation where a lot of people are praying that there will be a spiritual awakening. And you know one of the first things that happens when people have a spiritual awakening is they get depressed, distressed, and deeply troubled. You know why? Because they're lost. <laughs> they begin to realize that life isn't worth it. What used to be really fun is now real empty. What used to be exciting is now, you know, not so great. And we, most of us, we've been there, right? We started doing things that were a lot of fun for a while, and then they became increasingly empty. Um, and sometimes as a young believer, we do things that aren't so bright either. I, I remember the very first Bible study that I was teaching. This was 19, well, it was the first out-of-town Bible study. It was like 1971. I'm living in a discipleship house. I get invited to go from Novato, California, where we live, to a place called Paradise, California. It's not a true paradise. Recently, there were major fires there, and a lot of people died in the fires, and a lot of the town got burned up. But it sounded great. I'd never been there before. They were going to have a Bible study, and they wanted me. So I knew they had really good taste, and uh, I was looking forward to it, and I was nervous, and I was excited, and I was so nervous that I wanted to keep preparing on the drive up there, so I, let, I borrowed my mom's car, and I let my friend drive the car, and she had this big old station wagon, some kind of a Plymouth with all kinds of bells and whistles when it was new, now it was pretty old. And so my friend is driving, and we want to get there early, and uh, I just tell him to step on it, and I'm focusing on reading my Bible and putting my notes down. And uh, we, we get about literally 100 miles from Nevada. We're, we're going up Highway 5 towards Paradise. And, and it's just like we're going through this farm country, and it just smelled bad. You ever gone through farm country that just smells bad, you know? I'm like, this place stinks, you know? And, and then we're, we're going a little further, and, and it's like, man, roll up the windows. I mean, it's just like smoggy and stinky here. So roll up the windows, and, and I'm trying to study. And all of a sudden, this smoggy smoke is coming up from the floorboard. And I'm like, what? And I look over at the dashboard, and every light is lit up. You know what I mean? No oil, no water, no nothing. And he's like, quick, turn on the windshield wiper. We can't even see where we're going. And he's got the windshield wipers going, and then flames start coming out of the hood. And we, we pull over, and uh, we, we got out of the car before it totally burned up, and then it got towed to a gas station. And then we actually witnessed to some people and led them to the Lord. Um, but it was sort of a, a metaphor for my life. You know, that if things aren't going good, well, just go faster. You know what I mean? Just like, put your head down and go for it. We got to get there. The problem with that attitude is that if you don't have the oil in the car, you don't have the water in the car, if you don't have all the, the hoses hooked up, where you're heading, you might never arrive, or if you arrive there, you can arrive there with some kind of damage. And that was a metaphor for my life, because my life had been damaged. I had, I had gone all out for the wrong thing. And that's what happens to a lot of people in the last days, and they begin to realize that they are making a mess of their life, and they're not enjoying it. So when you meet people that are depressed, that are distressed, that are worried, that is often a really good sign. They're in touch with reality because they're spiritually dead. And you have shown up with good news about Jesus. Even though you still have a little depression and distress and things that you're concerned about with your own life, right? We all do. That's the nature of life. But 
by the grace of God. We're heading to heaven. We're heading to glory. We're empowered by the Spirit. We're experiencing grace. We're getting provided for by our Father in heaven. And as we discover that He's watching over us, He's providing for us, He's helping us along the way, then it helps us to relax and enjoy the journey because He promises what we're headed to is much greater than what we've left behind. So, we're going to get into the Word here. Focus on the last days. Starting in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, Peter is quoting this passage from the prophet Joel in Acts chapter 2 after the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the disciples on the day of Pentecost, and this is what he says. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Let's pray together. Father God, help me preach your word. Help us to receive the fullness of your spirit. Let us dream the dreams that come from your spirit. Let us believe the visions that you give us and cooperate with what your spirit wants to do in Jesus' name. The first thing I'm going to ask you is, What's going to be happening in the last days? Is it going to be good or bad? Well, this sounds pretty exciting. And some of you have experienced the Spirit, and you've been stimulated by the Spirit, and when you go to sleep at night, the Spirit makes you dreams. Now, we've all had bad dreams. We've all had scary dreams. We've all had lustful dreams and, and anger dreams. But when the Spirit starts giving you a dream, it's a whole different quality, and you know that when you wake up. You begin to uh, have a concept of who God is that you've never had before. You begin to have sometimes some direction, some hope that comes into your heart. And visions are the same ways. We, we've had visions that are deluded, deluded visions, but visions from the Spirit is an understanding that there's another reality and God wants to use you to enter that other reality to actually bring it to pass. So what I believe is that every single one of us who's got the Holy Spirit has visions and dreams, and God wants those to come to pass. We can't pull it off on our own, so we need to be teamed up with other people. The church is a gathering of people who commit their lives together in love in order that the dreams and visions that God is giving his people will actually come to pass. Because on our own, we couldn't do it. You might want to help a whole bunch of people, but on your own you can't do it. But together, we can make a huge difference in people's lives. Okay, so that's the first part of the last days here. But then he goes on to say in verse 19, I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs on the earth below, blood, fire, billows of smoke, the sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. A couple of years ago in the summer, when the fires burned paradise in Northern California, and they spread throughout Northern California, the wind began to blow the smoke down to where my son lives in San Rafael, and he said, Dan, the sky was dark at noon. People are driving around with their headlights on. The, when, when the sun came up, it was dark, as it said here. Sun will be turned to darkness. The moon was red from the, the, the fires. It literally turned it red. And this is a sign, a last day sign. Now Peter said that the last days were happening 2,000 years ago. So I want to give you a caveat right here. When I was a, a young believer and I heard last day's messages, I would think, wow, I hope he doesn't come too quick because I would like to get married first. Well, folks, I've been married for 50 years as of last month. You know what I mean? And that is good news. It's good news to find somebody you can do a covenant with for life and bear fruit together with for life. Walt's got good news. Louine, your news is okay, but you know what I mean? Keep working on it. You know what I mean? Um, I also dropped out of college because I thought, Jesus is coming so soon, why would I be wasting my time? And let me just say this about the last days. You should live with a conscience so clear that if he comes back tonight, you meet him tonight, you're ready to go. But you should also live, since nobody knows the day or the hour, 
as if he might not come back for another hundred years and you want to build your life into a more fruitful future. So you continue to take steps, not just to make you feel good today or what you're afraid God wants you to do, but what you believe he wants you to do in terms of preparing yourself for a fruitful future. Okay, now in 2 Timothy, it says this. So mark this in the third chapter. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful and unholy, without love, for unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You ever had a roommate like that? It's not fun to be around people like that. Having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. These people are hard to live with, they're hard to work with, they're hard to be in a society. And, and most of us have been that way at one time or another. And we've been redeemed. And we've been transformed by the grace of God. And we've repented, we've acknowledged that we don't want to live that way. But in the last days, the earth will be filled with people like that. So there's going to be great things, dreams and visions. There's going to be really difficult things because we're going to be around people that are going to be messy. Now, 2 Peter chapter 3 says this, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. Scoffing, following their own evil desires. They say, where is this coming in from? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. So people are saying, they get super skeptical. Oh, I've heard that story before, and it didn't come to pass. And then, why should we expect it to come to pass now? But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters, the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. He's talking about the floods of Noah's time, right? We would say the floods of Noah's time were climate change. It had never flooded like that before. Many historians believe it had never rained like that before. The earth was being watered primarily by a mist, you know, like a mist or system before this. But the Lord allowed for climate change, and the people that didn't believe it was going to happen missed the boat. Noah built the boat and he invited people on, but they weren't interested. They were more interested in keeping going with the party life that they were already living. So he says this, in verse 7, by the same word, the same word that created the earth, the same word that flooded the earth, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly reserved for fire. Now, what is that going to mean? He goes on to talk about it more, but I'll just sum it up this way. The earth is going to get hotter and hotter until it burns up. Is it going to happen immediately, like overnight, or is it going to happen over a longer period of time? Well, here, the next scripture says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. So it's going to happen quickly, but in our minds, but in God's timing, it could be a thousand years. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So God's patience, God's delay, is all about more people coming into the kingdom. So here's the thing. We're praying that there will be a spiritual awakening. Yes. And one of the signs that people are starting to be affected by a spiritual awakening is they become afraid of the future. They think the earth is going to be burning up and we're having climate change. And you know what? We shouldn't say, oh, no, no, that doesn't happen because it happens throughout the Bible. It happened to Pharaoh and all of Egypt when God brought hailstones and, and locust plagues. Jesus said it would be happening. It happened in Elijah's day where it didn't rain for three and a half years. It's going to happen again, Peter says, at the end, the earth is going to burn up. We should say, I'm glad you recognize 
this. I'm glad you know that it isn't going to be status quo and everybody living happily ever after. You need to get your life ready to meet the God of all creation. And you won't be afraid of the future whenever it comes down. We know things are going to get hot, right? Either in this world or the next world for a lot of people. We're trying to communicate the reality of the mercy and grace of God. So when they're troubled, when they're distressed, now we may disagree on what action should be taken. You know what I mean? They may be focused on the burning of fossil fuels. Now I think personally that we should leave the earth in as good or better shape for the next generation as we found it. We shouldn't pollute the, deplete the ozone layer, we shouldn't pollute the skies and you know, allow the forest to be burned. It all should be managed as best we can manage it. But we have some other items on the agenda that our God has shown us that is actually going to affect the climate, such as how do you treat the unborn children? How do you treat the poor? How do you treat the immigrant? How do you treat your spouse? Are you faithful? Are you loving? Are you kind? Or are you violent? Are you immoral? And are you a, a greedy whoremonger? Those are things that actually affect the climate. Just ask the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. They had climate change because of their evil behavior. They had it suddenly. It's all throughout Scripture. So when people are all into that kind of stuff, say, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad. You become aware of the reality that this world in its present state is not going to endure forever. There will be, however, a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, so what does Jesus have to say about this? This is the main thing I want to get into. I'm going to just briefly touch on Matthew 24, and then we're going to go into Matthew 25 to see what Jesus is telling us to do. Matthew 24. And it says Jesus left the temple walking away. Disciples came up to him. And he answered them in verse 4, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise up against nation. Russia will invade Ukraine. Um, on and on. Kingdom against kingdom. Um, you know, whether it's a, a Saddam Hussein or whether it's an Idi Ahmed, those guys are doing their evil deeds. There will be famines. Famines are a result of climate change and earthquakes in various places. There was an earthquake that killed over 2,000 people in Morocco just this week. All these are the beginning of birth things. These are the beginning of birth things means that there is a process going on. There's a, a baby being formed in the mother's womb. The beginning of birth pangs push the baby out of the womb, through the birth canal, and get it ready to be delivered. But this is the beginning. Um, in verse 9, then you'll be handed over to be persecuted, put to death, and you'll be hated all by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. You know, you know, here's what's sad to me. He didn't say COVID will come and, and some churches will divide. We'll have political leaders and some will like the Republicans and some will like the Democrats and people will hate each other because of that. And, and, and millions of people will stop going to church altogether. No, I mean, we are so wimpy in our society for people to, to fight over those kind of issues and quit going to church over that kind of stuff. He said, there's going to come a time when there's going to be real persecution, life and death kind of stuff, and, and some will fall away. We have to decide whether we're going to stay faithful while you're still healthy. Because you know what? You might not always be healthy. We can't promise somebody that the body that you used to abuse, that you're now dwelling in, is always going to be wonderful and healthy till the day you meet the Lord. No, you may go through some hard stuff. Many of you prayed for my wife and she got a heart transplant. She's doing really good by the grace of God. But some of the people she ministers to aren't doing so good. Their bodies have worn out, their hearts have failed, and they're about to meet the Lord. And that can happen to believers or non-believers. So, uh, skipping down to verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son. Jesus is saying, I don't know when this is 
going to happen, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. That's how it's going to be in the coming of the Son of Man. It's going to, people are going to just keep on partying. They're not all going to wake up. They're not all going to get the message. Our job is to bring the message of good news that life is not an accident. God has a plan. He has a purpose for each and every one of us. And anybody who calls on the name of the Lord can discover what that plan and purpose is. Okay, now what does Jesus say we're supposed to do in the last days? Matthew 25, 10 verses. You, you might need to take her in the other room because it's open over the fellowship hall. If you don't mind. Thank you. Um, the, he, Jesus is going to give three parables here. And these are important parables um, because they tell us how to behave in the last days. The first one, Matthew 25, verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in the jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom, come to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy them for, buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready, were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you don't know the day or the hour. Okay, so let's look at the last thing first. You don't know the day or the hour. I don't know the day or the hour. Jesus himself didn't know the day or the hour. But he said, you'll see in chapter 24, you're going to see these signs. Earthquakes, wars, famines, people hating each other, false messiahs, and all the rest. You're going to see those signs. So what you should, what should you do about it? You should be like the wise virgins. See, the virgins represent everybody that's expecting the Lord to come back. Ten virgins. Because no matter what kind of behavior you had in the past, when you are in Christ and you have been baptized, you have been cleansed by his blood, you are now a virgin. Okay? That's the good news. You are now a virgin. You can believe it. I've been married 50 years to a woman. Both of us have been immoral, unfortunately. But we gave our lives to Christ and we stayed holy and pure in him until we got married. And we have a fresh start, and we have 50 years of a wonderful testimony to declare because of it. So, regardless, that's not the main point. The main point is this. Not every virgin has enough oil to make it till the Lord comes. You know why? Some people are anticipating that he's coming so soon that they can go ahead and, and sort of like run out of gas. They can go ahead and, and not be prepared. I talk to pastors all the time because that's my ministry. So I said I'm not retired because I work to make sure pastors are healthy. If pastors are healthy, they have a better chance of having their whole church healthy. And you'd be surprised how many pastors are running out of oil. They are getting burned out. I had a, another car story that I'll tell you real quick, but... When I was 17 years old, my friend uh, Bill Slaney and I were up at the Sierra Nevada Mountains on a ski trip with my parents. And um, we were supposed to meet my parents at uh, Oreo Ridge, which is one of the ski resorts 
before we headed back to Marin County where we live. And the problem with us is we hadn't skied on the Sunday. We skied on Saturday, but Saturday night we met some girls and we wanted to hang out with these girls on Sundays. And one thing led to another and we were running a little late. I'll just leave it at that. We were running a little late. So we got in my parents' car because um, we had two cars. They had one and we had one of their other cars and we were speeding to meet them. And we were going pretty quick because I was driving and we had a Studebaker. Ever seen one of those Studebakers in the old days? They, you couldn't tell if they're going forward or backward because of points on both ends. And I had my foot to the floor. We were going like a hundred. And, um, and, and we were going so quick we couldn't see the Boreal Ridge turn off. And after a while, there was no more snow on Highway 80 because we had come out of the mountains altogether. Now we thought we better really get home quick and maybe clean up the house before they get home and apologize to them. There's no cell phones or anything like that. So then now I'm going 110 because it was sort of downhill anyway. I'm going 110 and we're, we're flying along and then I'm going 100 and then I'm going 90 and 80 and we're slowing down but my foot is all the way down on the grass. And it turns out I blew the rods out of the engine. That car never traveled again. We spent the night sleeping in the car on the side of the freeway. And my dad had to come up and tow us with the car back. He was not really happy about that. It was expensive to have me as a kid, as a lost kid. It was really, really expensive. But we had no business driving a car that fast and many of us we have a good motive we want to serve god we want our lives to count so we put our foot to the metal and just power on every day all day into the night on the next day into the night on the next day into the night we don't sabbath we, we keep nine of the ten commandments we don't lie murder steal commit adultery bear false witness, but well, we don't rest either. And eventually we can blow out, just like we blew out that car. And these 10 virgins are a lesson that not every believer is going to make it unless they've got enough oil. Your oil is a, it, it's symbolic of the Holy Spirit. You have got to stay filled with the Spirit, commensurate to the challenges and pressures you're going to face as a believer, and there will be many challenges and pressures. That's why Jesus himself withdrew from people to take time with God. Okay, the second of these three parables, and this is the main one I want to emphasize for you tonight. It's the parable of the talents, the bags of gold. Verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey. What's it? He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the reality of what it's like to know God on this earth so that we can know him in heaven. It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one bag, and each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. So most of you know this story, so I'm going to cut to the chase on this story. The master represents our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven has given each one of us some bags of gold, some five, some two, some one. And we have a charge, we have a responsibility, invest this money according to the master's will. Now, obviously this is more than just about money, it's about talents, it's about gifts and talents. You're not just called to preach the gospel, you may be called to sing the gospel. You may be called to write your testimony, write the gospel. You may be called to do letters, you may be called to do email, you may be called to bring encouragement to people through text. You may use phone calls, you may go visit people. There's a ton of ways that you can learn to bless others, to build others, to put your gifts and talents 
to work. You may be a cook. You may be able to make beautiful meals for people. You may be a servant. You may be able to clean up after the person that made the beautiful meal. Somebody's got to do it, right? You, you have a gift, you have a talent, and you will discover the supernatural dynamic of this natural function by obeying the prompting of the Holy Spirit, sharing with people in love. Not everybody wants to hear me preach. Not everybody wants to eat your cooking. Not everybody read my book. Not everybody's going to appreciate the letter you send them. That's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is develop our talents as best we possibly can. Okay? And let's go to the first illustration of this. It was about money. We all have money. Some of us have a lot of money. Some of us have a little bit of money. It's not about how much you have. It's about what you're doing with what you've got. If you're doing what God wants you to do with what you've got, you are being a faithful servant. And here's what he says about being a faithful servant. He says in verse 19, After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, in my notes, I underline that word, come and share your master's happiness. You know, you know why that what, what that says to me? God, who knows everything that's going on, he's not depressed. He's not even discouraged. As a matter of fact, he's happy. He is happy because he's got all these kids and grandkids. But doesn't he know how messed up we are? He does, believe me. He knows far more about the mess we've been in than anybody else. And yet, he's still not depressed. He's still not discouraged. And that's why when we love each other and we find out how messy other people's lives are, we shouldn't get depressed and discouraged about that. Because our God is a God who's got joy. Jesus said, love one another, that the joy that I have may be in you. Jesus had joy. He had joy that he received from his Father. And that's the reward of God. I have friends that are super wealthy. Some of them are super wealthy and super distressed. Others are very poor and very blessed. I would rather be blessed than distressed. So it's not about how much your money you've got. It's really about what's happening in your soul. And Jesus is giving instructions for the last days. And he says that when I give you talents, whether it's financial talents, it's time and energy, or it's different ways of expressing uh, the creative nature of God since you're made in his image and likeness, because you're made in his image and likeness, you have a supernatural dynamic to you. Every now and then we'll see an athlete do something phenomenal. You know, the, a gymnast who does a perfect 10, or an athlete who can catch the ball or, or shoot threes. I, I saw a, a video of Steph Curry making one three-point shot just right after another in practice, just boom, 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 boom. The guy has got a supernatural gift for it. And now, it was a natural gift that he worked really hard to develop, and now it's, we call it supernatural because he expresses the image of God in that arena. And you will too if you believe in the one who has called you. There will be an area of life that people will say, wow, how did you know? How did you know that's exactly what I needed to hear or to receive or to have, have you show up? How did you know? And you said, I just knew because you're in touch with the Father and the Father knows it all. And Jesus said, everything I have comes from him. And I'm going to give everything I have to you. So we got all we need. Okay, so anyway, you know that there was one guy here that he just buried his talent, right? He buried it. Why? He says, well, God is so 
hard. He's so difficult to please. Jesus said, you are wicked and lazy. You're wicked because you're distorting who God is, and you're lazy because you don't want to bother to share what I've given you. That's lazy and wicked. And you can be poor, lazy, and wicked, or rich, lazy, and wicked. Doesn't matter. It just shrivels your soul if that's how you behave. And the consequences, the consequences that we bring on ourselves, verse 28, let's skip down to verse 28. Take the bag of gold from him, give it to the one who has ten bags, for whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken away from them. Throw that worthless servant outside in the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, that's as far as I want to go. Um, None of us want to be outside with weeping and gnashing of teeth. We want to have the joy of the master. And so really, you've been dealt a hand. You know, you've been dealt a hand. Some of those cards are not pleasant. Others are really, really special. The Spirit of God is going to empower you to play that hand. You, my mom used to play bridge a lot. And bridge, they have a game in bridge where you play these cards and then you swap positions with somebody else and you play the cards that they play. And the game is, who can get the highest score playing the cards? And, and all four people at the table end up playing the same cards as they rotate around. And that's a picture of how life is for us. We are dealt a hand and God tells us to play that hand and he tells us we're going to win with that man. We're going to triumph because of Christ in us. We're going to overcome as he has overcome. He tells us not to worry about the trials because he has overcome this world. So let's play the hand that we've been given. And in the last days, take advantage of all the distress and trouble because that's what God is using to help people hear the message that we have, which is not an easy message, but it's the truth that can set people free. Can we pray? Thank you, Father, for the men and women who are here tonight. Lord God, you have called us to equip us, to anoint us, to use us, to bring blessings and glory and honor to you and bear much fruit. And I ask, Lord God, that my brothers and sisters will believe you they won't focus on what the past has been like, but they'll believe you for your love today, for your equipping power today, for your grace today, your saving grace. And be filled with hope and the power of the Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay.